Maybe I will do it. Yeah, it's uh, it says you are now live and recording. Ah, yes, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, okay good. I will. Um... Okay, good. Okay, perfect. You can see my slides, uh, Frank. Okay. So, good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon, late. Uh, thank you for uh, for joining this session today. Um, on uh, positive leadership during times of turbulence. I'm delighted to be with you today, and I hope there are a number of uh, takeaways from, uh, from this, uh, from this uh, session uh, for you. Um, in terms of um, introducing myself briefly, um, my name is Nick Van Dam. I'm at IE University in Madrid. Uh, IE University is a global university, um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm board member I'm the academic director, I'm faculty of a number of leadership programs, and I'm also the, the chief of an IE Center for Corporate Learning uh, Innovation. Um, in terms of um, other roles, um, I'm, I'm teaching a number of programs, also in collaboration with other universities, including the University of Pennsylvania, um, where I'm um, involved in an, a wonderful program for um, uh, chief Learning Officers, an executive doctorate program, uh, and I'm also a faculty member um, in collaboration with Nine Road uh, Business University in the Netherlands. Um, I'm an author of a number of books. Um, I've always re re liked to reflect on what's happening and, uh, and basically write my thoughts, my, my research, and a couple of interesting books, actually, on the right side, and we will talk about it today. Uh, you, the positive force in change. Um, then we have a book on the left side that I co-authored with a number of my McKinsey colleagues and partners, uh, Leadership at Scale. It's an, a cookbook on leadership development. And then there are two other books, Elevating Learning and Development, and a book on authentic confidence. Um, prior to IE, I have had a career in professional services and consulting um, as a partner, uh, global chief learning officer, an HR executive at Deloitte and my last role at McKinsey and Company. And I'm still affiliated with uh, the firm, with McKinsey, as an external senior advisor and a faculty member of a number of leadership programs. So, um, so my presentation today, I, I think if we all reflect on uh, the last, you know, eight, nine months of this year um, and we sit back, um, this is obviously a, a very interesting time. Um, you know, we have the pandemic, uh, but has a huge impact on, 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 on people, on, on health, on mental health. Um, we have globally an economic downturn, uh, um, what has a huge impact on, on corporations. And as we know, some of them are flourishing, are doing really well, but other ones are, and other sectors are hit very, very, very significantly. And then also on the right side above, actually, we have, uh, you know, we see unemployment is, is rising in a number of countries. Um, and, you know, last but not least, you also we deal with some, you know, huge challenges when it comes to climate. So if you reflect on this, it's kind of, it can sound like a daunting story. Uh, but I would like to start actually on a very positive note, uh, because I truly believe that the future looks really bright. Um, you know, from an academic perspective, pandemic perspective, uh, sorry, from a pandemic perspective, um, you know, there's, there's great news about vaccines, uh, better treatment. Um, and I'm very optimistic that we will see a big change in 2021 when it comes to the pandemic. Um, but also, if you reflect on opportunities, you know, there are amazing uh, opportunities when it comes to the energy transition that's kind of happening globally. And for the next 10, 20 years, there will be a lot of exciting opportunities to be part of this. But also when we think about the way we work, how, um, we think about what companies look like, what offices look like, uh, very different. You know, the, the workplace, the culture of organizations have become way more human, way more exciting um, than it has ever been before. Um, but reflecting on technologies, you know, and uh, we are, according to the World Economic Forum, just at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. And this revolution is fueled by advancements in technologies, similar to what we have seen in the first, the second 
and third industrial revolution. Now, if you reflect on the technologies that are entering the workforce, uh, think about artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, robotization, the Internet of Things. Um, and then think about all the, the, the data, the power of data and analytics. So tremendous opportunities to uh, reinvent business models, you know, launch new companies who are, who are embracing all the new technologies uh, so very, very exciting. And last but not least, also leadership is changing. We see the need and the practice of human leadership practices, uh, where basically leaders really take care of people, are building high-performing teams, and leveraging a different leadership principles and leadership styles to make it all happening. So, and then uh, another, I, I think, exciting story is... Uh, um, you know, The Hundred Year Life, it's a book published by a friend of mine, Linda Gretton, from the Jewish professor at the London Business uh, School. Um, and she published her book a couple of years ago. And she looked at a lot of research that has been done uh, related to health in, um, health in societies. And based on uh, that research, uh, she, she predicts that um, uh, over 70% uh, of people who are born after 2007 or babies born after 2007 in Western countries will likely celebrate their 100th, ber 100th birthday. So if you reflect on that, we all live longer and also means we will be longer in the workforce, can have very exciting careers with a lot of different chapters. And if we look at, you know, jobs today and jobs in the future, we have seen over the last decade already a huge shift when it comes to jobs that are in demand. And no surprise, you know, they are linked to all these new technologies that are entering the workforce. You know, the, the World Economic Forum published a report two weeks ago on the future of jobs. And the number one job that is in the high demand is everything what relates to data science sciences. Uh, uh, but if you look at this slide, there are many roles which are very exciting. Um, and also, um, you know, students are educated in, in completely different fields. Uh, like, as an example, um, you can take a bachelor degree or a, or a master degree uh, to become a drone operator or a drone designer. Uh, so, so something that did not exist uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. A lot of humans will, um, will work with robots uh, moving forward, and the robot will augment what we are doing as humans in the work in the workplace. I've mentioned a lot of roles related to the energy transition, uh, but also a lot of roles that have to do with innovation, uh, change uh, in organizations. So a very exciting time for those of us who have the right skills, the right backgrounds, the right mindsets. Now, if you reflect on my story, we are living in a new world. There's a new way of working and new organizations. It also requires new leadership, as I mentioned. And for leadership practices, I like to uh, zoom in on uh, a very exciting uh, uh, field of study, and that is uh, positive psychology. And positive psychology um, will study uh, people, teams, and organizations who are flourishing. Now, let's assume that if, if I would do a survey today and I would ask people a question about their degree of happiness, well, what you typically get is the bell-shaped curve. And on the left side of the curve, you have the least, you know, people are the least flourishing. And um, the research from clinical psychology, from organizational psychology, is typically uh, focusing on uh, the left side of the curve. And they hope to develop a number of practices that can help people to, you know, to become, to, to feel better. Um, but positive psychology will focus on the right side. They say, well, what can we learn from people, from teams, from organizations who are flourishing? And can we um, use the practices and the mindsets to basically move other people and other organizations more to the right side of this curve. 
and this uh, this relatively new science um, um, started actually uh, by a person who has coined the term uh, positive psychology in the 50s of the last century. And that is a person you probably all know. Um, it's, the name, his name is Abraham Maslow on the left side. And he wrote his book, uh, Motivation and Personality. And he just mentioned positive psychology, but he did not go deep into it. And it took more than 40 years because before uh, Martin Zellekman, who is a professor at UPenn, uh, started uh, the researching um, this new science. And he has coined, actually, he is seen as the father of positive psychology. Now, uh, since 1990, there are a number of scholars uh, involved in this field, um, like Barbara Fredrickson, who has done amazing research on, on positive emotions, or Jane Dutton, uh, as a professor who has done fantastic work on compassion, or Alan Langer, uh, who has looked at, looked at uh, uh, mindfulness and mindful learning. And you see a number of uh, publications here on uh, on my slide. And no, not a surprise to you, I bet, that, you know, uh, uh, courses electives on positive psychology has been the most popular courses at Harvard and Stanford when it comes to electives. And also at IE University, um, we have we have um, an, an, a center for health, well-being, and happiness, and uh, we are making uh, courses on positive psychology part on everybody's curriculum. Now, if you reflect on my uh, on the science of of uh, positive psychology, you may ask yourself, well, what are uh, some of the uh, in most important uh, uh, positive leadership practices. So let me share you um, an, an overview of uh, of the practices and mindsets. Well, on this slide you see you see a number of them. Um, as an example, think about um, posi building positive relationships, um, having uh, uh, communicating in a positive way. Think about. Uh, the role of optimism and positivity, um, uh, engagement and flow, but also building trust, you know, very important in times where people have to work a lot from home, um, that as leaders, we build trust among our teams. Think about authentic self-confidence. And I, I published a book on authentic confidence based on research that I've done with a couple of uh, colleagues and friends of, friends of mine. Uh, a very powerful mindset and skill that can be developed and will help people to become the best version of themselves. Uh, but also great practicing gratefulness um, that will help people to feel good about themselves uh, and living in the now. So a lot of practices that have a, if you apply them as a leader, as a professional, will have a huge positive impact uh, on the culture in, in your organization. Now, today, of course, I cannot go through all of them, but I will pick a few of them and, and just share you a couple of uh, uh, key insights. One is a mindset uh, on optimism and positivity. And that's a mind, that is a, um, a mindset that, that, uh, that Barbara Fredrickson, a professor in the United States, has done a, a lot of research on. And she discovered that um, you know, if you look at our daily weeks, uh, we all um, experience uh, moments uh, that will give us positive emotions, but also negative emotions. And her uh, research shows that in order for us as humans to feel well, we need to be we need to have three positive uh, emotions in order to compensate for one negative emotion. And she's calling that the positivity ratio three to one. Now, if you listen to this, the question is, okay, um, how can I, you know, make sure that that's happening? And it's a simple exercise. You could write down for yourself uh, initiatives or activities, moments that will give you a positive emotion. For, as an example, for myself, uh, just uh, uh, connecting with a colleague and having a cappuccino uh, and having a nice chat will give me a positive emotions. So, so therefore, if we know what 
uh, is, is helping us and giving us positive, positive emotions, we can schedule those activities on our calendar. Because activities that will cause negative emotions will happen anyway. And a number of those activities we cannot control. So therefore, in order to flourish, to feel fine, happy, uh, make sure that we schedule these uh, events, moments that will give us positive emotions. Then another very important mindset and practice is lifelong learning. As I mentioned, we will be in the workforce for 50 years. And that means that we have to um, develop a number of competencies and, uh, and we have to upskill and reskill ourselves during our lifetime uh, a number of times. Now, if you say, well, Nick, what are the most important competencies by 2025? And on this slide, you will see a number of different um, themes. And they have been launched or developed and, 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 and published uh, by the World Economic Forum two weeks ago. Um, now, there are other reports as well, uh, reports from uh, uh, McKinsey, from um, uh, the World, World Bank, and they all point in the same direction. Now, the, the, the blue ones are more the cognitive competencies. Think about analytical thinking, how we solve problems, um, how we analyze uh, situations, uh, but also reasoning and ideation. And then we have the human competencies, the green ones. Well, think about creativity, originality, uh, but also leadership and social influence. Um, new this year, a very important competence for everyone in the workforce relates to resilience, stress tolerance, and flexibility. And as I mentioned, active learning, learning and unlearning are key. Now, and the last, uh, the red ones, uh, the, the technology competencies, you know, everybody agrees that, you know, we need to develop uh, and deepen our proficiency levels in technologies, uh, systems, system architecture, uh, programming, uh, understanding how you can use applications, how you can use different technologies to change business models, optimize business models, etc. Very important. Everybody needs to be more and more proficient in technology as a key competence. But in order to um, develop ourselves, it's not just a matter of taking a course. Everything starts with um, a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is also an example of a positive leadership practice. And um, Carol Dweck, who's a professor at Stanford, has done a lot of research over the last uh, 20, 30 years on mindsets for learning. And what she discovered is that there are two types of people. One group of people who say, I have a fixed mindset. And they tell themselves that intelligence is static. You cannot develop it. My, my potential is known. It's fixed. And people have a growth mindset. They tell themselves, well, intelligence can be developed. My potential is unknown. I can continue to learn and grow throughout my entire life. And there are a number of beliefs associated with the growth and the fixed mindset. So as an example, people with a growth mindset, they embrace challenges. They embrace change. They persist in the face of any setbacks that we all experience in our careers. They see effort as a path to mastery. They learn from feedback from other people. And if they look at others who are successful, they see it as a source of inspiration. And therefore, it's so important to have and develop a growth mindset. And it's also backed up by research. We know that uh, IQ can change over lifetime. Our, our IQ can go up. Uh, and we know that we can continue to learn throughout our entire life because from the, we know from the neurosciences that we can make all kinds of new connections in our brain. And this is called neuroplasticity. So as humans, we, are, we can learn and grow as long as we are healthy. 
So key is embracing this mindset. A second mindset has to do with stretch. And what we do, what and stretch relates to the following. If you think about the work that you are doing today, and if that's similar to what you did yesterday and the week before and the month before and the year before, we just become better of what we are doing. We are in our comfort zone. But unfortunately, we don't learn anything new. We learn new things by doing things that we have never done before. So we are stretching ourselves. And that means we are moving into our learning zone. And in the learning zone, we do new things. That's kind of where we learn and grow. And after a while, the, the circle of the comfort zone will expand. It will include the learning zone because we, are, we have mastered the new tasks, the new competencies. And then we have an opportunity to stretch again. And, and to move out of our new comfort zone and to continue learn and grow. Another key development uh, model that has been used with McKinsey, but also at other organizations, is the concept of the, the, the S-curve, or your personal career curve. And if you look at this two by two, it shows uh, on the horizontal line um, how the time that you are in a role can be a month, a year, two years, three years, etc. And then you also see the impact from light, light, low to high. Now, if you have moved into a new role over the last year, you may reflect on what I'm, what I'm sharing. If you're new in a role and let's say new in an organization, uh, there's a lot you have to sort out. You are in a new team, there are new processes, different technologies, a different leadership team, stakeholders, etc. So that means the first two or three months, you are not kind of going, uh, performing extremely high in your role, if you look at this S-curve. Uh, but then after a while, you really understand your organization, your role, the people, the technology, everything. And then basically, you start learning a lot and, and your impact is going up very significantly. If you look at the, the, the S, the S in the curve. And then if people are longer in their role, what can happen easily is that they get a little bit bored, been there, done it. They don't learn a lot of new things anymore. So their impact is flattening or even it can decline. Now, what's the key, well, key insight from this model is that every professional, every leader need to reflect on where are you in your S curve? Are you at the beginning? Are you at this inflection point with huge impact? Or are you closer to the top? And then if we reflect on being in the workforce for 50 years, well, uh, we can learn, um, we can grow, but you know, what's very important is that we stay vital. Um, you know, leading organizations, leading teams, all start with leading self. So vitality is a very important concept. And this is a model that I've developed with an, a friend of mine, a colleague uh, at IE and a medical professional in the United States, uh, Noemi Le Pertel. And we have developed this model where you see health, body, the well-being, the mind, and happiness, purpose, and meaning. And there are a number of dimensions of this model as you see in this, uh, this, as you see on this slide. Now, today we don't have time to go through all of this. I will just showcase uh, two different uh, elements of this model. And the first is sleep. Now you say, wow, Nick, sleep. Why is that? Why is that important? Well, um, um, you know, a, a friend of mine and, and, and Corley, a former colleague, uh, her name is Els van der Helm. Uh, she has done a lot of research on sleep. She got a PhD from Berkeley uh, on sleep. And uh, what we know is that sleep or lack of sleep has a huge impact on mental capacities like uh, attention, concentration, creativity, uh, learning, uh, but also how our, our emotional system. Now, if you probably reflect on one question I have, did you ever send an email late at night uh, to someone in your organization? And the day after you said to yourself, hmm, maybe this was not a good idea. And the reason is that our uh, emotional system is highly impacted 
by lack of sleep. And uh, at McKinsey, we have done a lot of research on what are the most important leadership behaviors for, for leaders. And we identified four. The one is results orientation, solving problems, seeking different perspectives from other people, but also supporting others, supporting teams. And guess what? Um, all these leadership behaviors are highly impacted by, uh, by lack of sleep. So therefore, you know, as a foundation, one takeaway from today, hopefully, is, you know, you want to be an outstanding leader, make sure that sleep uh, is a priority. And there's an article, uh, The Organizational Cost of Insufficient Sleep. Uh, you can Google under my name. Uh, there's also an, an article from Harvard Business Review, also on sleep. You can also Google it uh, as well. And now you say, well, Nick, sleep, it sounds a little bit like a soft topic, right? Well, uh, if you look at uh, key leaders in the world, you know, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, um, you know, uh, Google, Alphabet, uh, former Eric Smith uh, in, 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 that, in that role, all of them, they have mentioned to their uh, colleagues, to their employees, to their leaders, that they take their sleep, you know, uh, serious. Uh, and, you know, they also encourage everyone to do the same thing. Sleep at least seven, seven and a half hours a night. Ideally, you know, eight, a little bit more than eight. Uh, because it has a huge impact on your, on your performance. The second theme that I like to talk about is meaning and purpose. It's also a positive leadership practice. And um, if you reflect on, uh, on purpose, purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. And what's the power of purpose? People have a purpose. Well, it connects people. It also, it energizes people and it aligns and it gives people direction. And what we know is that uh, people who um, uh, have a purpose are way more focused, are, are happier and have less stress. Um, you know, and, and organizations are reflecting on this and, and making this a priority to figure out if people indeed have a purpose. So as an example, the global financial services organization, ING, sent 9,000 people to a workshop, purpose to impact. And guess what? They learned from this workshop that, well, there are a number of people who came out of that workshop and said, well, honestly, I learned that my purpose is not necessarily aligned with this organization and might be time to move on. While other people felt like, wow, I'm indeed, I'm at the right place because this, what I do uh, is, has a really impact and it is a nice connection with my personal purpose. And as individuals have a purpose, also organizations need to have a purpose. Now, if you look at this two by two, you will see uh, that, um, you know, on the horizontal line, uh, low purpose, high purpose, and vertically, low profit, high profit. Now, if you are low on purpose and low on of profit, guess what? You know, you have no funding to continue. You will go out of business. If you are high on purpose, but you have no funding either, no profit, guess what? It also will be hard to sustain that. But also organizations who are only focusing on profit, 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 shareholder value, and have, you know, are very low on purpose, it's a, not a sustainable business model. And it will be harder and harder to attract and retain people. So therefore, everybody is moving to this quadrant high on purpose and high on profit. Now, when organizations reflect on the purpose, they look at the UN sustainability goals, you know, related to poverty or, or, or the environment or water or uh, development. And they make that part of their, you know, DNA of their organization. And what's very exciting is that um, if people align, you know, their purpose is that's aligned with what the company purpose, magic will happen. So we know that, you know, people are way more uh, engaged, way more motivated, but also they learn um, more if they do something in an organization that is really, that really supports their personal purpose and also the organization purpose. So if you reflect on, um, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the impact of uh, positive leadership practices. Well, um, if you think about, you know, building high performing teams, it's all supported by leaders who are practicing all these, you know, positive leadership practices, inspirational, uh, inspiring people, creating an, an, a caring environment, communicate, over communicate, you know, building trust. Trust is a key concept uh, when it comes to uh, engagement and, and, and motivation. Um, but also having honest uh, conversations with people about how they are doing and giving developmental feedback. Um, but also high performing teams have leaders who solve problems. They don't let them linger. Um, important, you know, in, uh, we are at times where we have to make 100% of all the decisions with maybe 30% of the information. So we need to be vulnerable, also humble and say, you know what, you know, based on what we know, this seems to be the right decision and we might change course if, if needed in the next couple of months. And finally, what's so important for retaining people is that we celebrate, that we reward success um, because that will help us to really build high-performing teams. And now, from a business impact perspective, will, will it have an impact? Yes, we know that people who work in companies with a positive climate, they have, they have less stress, um, you know, lower, lower burnout, um, they have more energy, and uh, they are way more productive. So a very strong case. Now, if you'd like to know more about this, um, you know, I'm the co-director with um, Noemi Lepertel on an exciting program, an executive master program at IE. Uh, for It's a part-time program for busy professionals on positive leadership and uh, 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 positive psychology, uh, leadership and transformation. This program will start in January. We are still accept accepting a few more candidates. It's a virtual program with uh, three uh, residential retreats which will happen mostly in the second part of next year. So if you are interested, uh, you might uh, check out the IE website for this. And finally, um, you know, I believe that when I talk with parents and, and uh, colleagues around the world, they always say, uh, Nick, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, education is the most important thing for myself, but also for my children. And, you know, what we know on that topic is that, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of children are not going to school. But even prior to the pandemic, um, about 70 million children uh, did not get uh, a high, uh, didn't go to school. And a couple of hundred millions of children got poor education. But that's why I launched the foundation, uh, e-learning for kids, and we make uh, digital learning available for children all over the world. Um, and it will focus on math. So we have a portal called Math World and another portal, portal called Science World. So if you have children, you know, uh, in this age category, please, you know, share the website with them, elearningforkids.org. But also if you are connected with a school uh, uh, in your town uh, or teachers, please share uh, the website. And finally, because this is a foundation, we always are interested in raising funding so we can develop more courseware and we can translate it in more different languages. So, and finally, and I, and I might be able to take a few questions if you have so, you have them. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, I've published a number of books. Here are three of them. Um, and all the royalties for the books will be donated to the eLearning for Kids Foundation. So I hope that my presentation uh, has given you some insights in, uh, in, in uh, practices for leaders in times of turbulence, uh, using all these uh, positive leadership practices, which are rooted in the, in the positive psychology that will make a huge difference in, for yourself and in your organization. And there's a famous, a famous saying, uh, strategy eats culture at uh, for culture, each strategy at breakfast. So culture, people, talent is everything what's important. So um, what I wish you, if you listen to this, uh, to this uh, webinar, think about your future, think about your own personal development, because if you're in your mid-40s, you are halfway throughout your career, 
and I believe the next careers are all about the M model. We need to continue to develop ourselves at different times uh, during our lives. So thank you so much for listening. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And I wish you a terrific uh, uh, conference today. Thank you. It looks like it was a question for Amandeep. Uh, Amandeep, you can grab the phone and uh, hope I can hear you. Yeah, I have given you uh, access to the phone. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Uh, many thanks for this masterclass. This was just absolutely amazing. And I, 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 I was just checking the course. Is this a course like executive master positive uh, leadership? But you mentioned ex uh, psychology something. So I was confused about the title. Yeah, it's uh, the official uh, name of the program. It's an executive master in positive leadership and transformation. Um, and it's based on insights from uh, positive psychology and the neurosciences. Yeah. Many thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're welcome. Take yeah. it up. Thanks. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Um, let me see if there are more questions in the chat. Uh, I'm looking at uh, anybody else. Um, if there's a question, thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, for being with me. Uh, I don't see other questions at this point. Um, okay. Well, if this is um, there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank you so much for uh, again for attending. Wish you a wonderful conference, and then um, you know, uh, hopefully, we will be in touch. Uh, all the best.